wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. I'm sitting here going through some of the mail that we get here at, at uh, our address. Uh, you'll see it on the screen in a little while. You can write to us if you'd like to. Here, here are just some of the packages that uh, people send along with the mail, uh, letters, and so forth. And most of these are telling me what I've done wrong, <laughs> telling me that, uh, you know, there's something I teach that they don't like and that, um, that they um, uh, want to correct me. I'm always glad to be instructed. And I want you to know that uh, I, I'm not, I don't have a franchise on the truth. Uh, you, we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. We believe Jesus Christ is God who became man uh, to be our Savior, went to Calvary and died for our sins, was buried, was rose again the third day. One day he's going to come back and take us home with him. We believe that God's grace is all that God is free to do for us through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the issue today is that you need to pass from death to life. When you trust Jesus Christ exclusively as your, as your Savior, God takes your sin forgives your sin, sends it to the cross, and then gives you his life. And the issue in the Christian life is not whether you're a Baptist or Methodist, Catholic or Lutheran or uh, anything else in a denomination. Uh, I remember years ago, Phil Donahue asked uh, Francis Schaeffer on his show, he said, is God a Christian? <laughs> and uh, Dr. Schaeffer said, no, God's not a Christian. God's God. And that's where we feel here. You're not, you don't have to be a part of any particular uh, denomination, religion. In fact, it's better not to be. Uh, there's a recent um, uh, video on Facebook that got, got a lot of popularity, Why I Hate Religion and Love Jesus. And that's pretty much the way we feel. And, and yet we, we know that we don't have a franchise on Him or the truth. God's Word is what's true. And as we study God's Word, we want to understand God's Word. And that's why we talk to you about rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And whether there's all these different ideas that everybody can have and response and so forth, or whether it's just what God says, the, 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 the desire is to find the truth of God's Word, uh, not the confusion that man brings. And the key to understanding God's Word is to rightly divide the Word of truth. But friend, if you don't have a Word that you can trust, a Bible that you can believe, a Bible that never makes a mistake, a Bible that you can put on your table and every time you disagree with it, you're wrong and it's right. One that you can read in your language that can be your final objective authority outside of yourself, sitting on the table, being the boss. If you don't have that, well, then you need to find that because that's the place where you have to start. And one of the fundamental reasons there's so many different ideas in, in, in spiritual things and in Christianity is because people don't have that absolute final authority to speak. Now, when we say we believe the Bible, we, we mean the King James Bible, if you're an English-speaking person. Now, somebody says, I don't speak English. Well, then you get, get, get it in your language. But we're talking English here. And God has, has not just written His Word. He's preserved it through history. And He's made it available to us in the authorized version of the Bible, in our language, in a way that we can understand it. Then when you have God's Word, then you write to divide God's Word. You can get the profit out of His Word that He put in His Word. One of the common stories that you hear is passed down from one campfire to the next campfire. I was, I was a Boy Scout when I was young, Cub Scout and a Boy Scout. And we used to go out on these little, little, little uh, camping trips and we'd sit around the campfire and people would tell us the stories. And when you got to be a Boy Scout, you'd take the Cub Scouts out and you'd tell them the stories that you heard when you were, you, you know, the Boy Scouts told you when you were a Cub Scout and, and just keep passing them on down. Preachers do that. That's one of the fundamental reasons we have seminaries where you send preachers to learn the campfire stories to pass down. And one of the great campfire stories that you hear that, that really teach you not to believe the Bible, making you think you're learning something about the Bible, is what I call the agape myth. Did you ever hear about, uh, get, get your Bible turn with me to John chapter 21. Uh, it's not uncommon to hear people take this passage in John chapter 21 and try to make the point 
that, that there is a difference in the Bible uh, and that the secret to, to understanding this passage is to understand the meaning of the Greek words behind the word love. Agape. A fellow wrote a book one time called Sloppy Agape. <laughs> and that's, that's about the best use of the word agape I ever heard. In the Greek language, there are several words for the word and the term love. There's the word eros. We use erotic. Uh, there's the word phileo. We use the word, for example, Philadelphia. Delphia is brother, phileo, brotherly love. And then there's the word agape. All those words mean love. Now, the, the thing the preachers tell you is that when you see the word agape and the word phileo, that one is talking about God's love, agape, this pure, divine, disinterested love from God. Phileo, well, that's a, a lesser word. That's a human word. That's a word about human relationships. And in Philippians, John chapter number 21, this, this is the text where everybody likes to go to demonstrate that there's a difference. And, and there's, there's this secret, hidden meaning behind the text that if you don't understand what the Greek words behind the word love here is, then you can't get. Now, in the text, what, he, what he's talking about, John 21, verse 15. When they had dined, that's, that's talking about Jesus and his apostles. This is after the resurrection, uh, and, and they've gone fishing. He's told them to come in. They've come in, and he's prepared uh, uh, a meal for them on the, ta on, the, uh, on the shore. And when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my lambs. And he said unto him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Jonah, Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Now people read that, and they try to understand why in the world would that, what in the world has that got to do with anything here at the end of the book of John, right before the, the, the uh, account, account is over with. And they say, Oh, well, we got it. Because when, when Jesus says in verse 15, Simon, son of, uh, of Jonas, lovest thou me? The word love there, is the, he said, do you agape me? And the note reference in the Bible that I'm using here in, in, in the note says agape, uh, used of divine love. <laughs> and that's real sweet. And the idea is Jesus is saying, Pete, do you agape me? Do you have this divine love for me? Then Peter answers and said, thou knowest that I love you. And Peter uses a different word. He uses the word phileo. And the, the reference Bible says, it's a lesser degree of love than agape. Jesus has said, do you love me up here supremely? And Pete says, Lord, you know I love you pretty good. It's the idea. And that you wouldn't get that if you didn't have the Greek word there. Verse 16. He said unto him the second time, Simon Barjonas, lovest thou me? Agapeest thou me? And he said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo thee. Again, agape, love me with this divine love. Well, Lord, you know I love you pretty good. And he said unto him, feed my sheep. Now, so far, eh, okay, we're doing okay. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? This time, Jesus, instead of said, Pete, do you agape me? He says, Pete, do you phileo me? Do you love me pretty good? And Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Peter's grieved that the Lord this time brought the bar down to where he said he was. Now the first time you read that, you say, wait a minute. Why would Pete be grieved if the Lord came down to his level? <laughs> that didn't make a whole lot of sense. 
said, Thou knowest that I phileo thee. So in verse 17, Christ uses the word phileo instead of agape. And the idea somehow is that what Jesus is doing is he kind of came down to Pete's level. One is inviting him up to the divine, transcendent love. And then he just goes, well, okay, do you just love me, phileo me? And you read that and you say, wow, that's, and, and, and preachers make, you know, preachers and Bible comments, they make a big deal out of this. You, you get any commentary about John 21, I guarantee you if, you, you, if you check 10 commentaries on John 21, eight of them will say exactly what I've been telling you about. You can read it and find out what the things they say. The idea is that our English translation somehow is lacking in substance um, because, because it doesn't communicate the difference between those Greek words. The difficulty with that is, is in verse 17. He said unto him the third time, Simon said, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? If this time he said phileo, and the previous two times he had said agape, well, if he said agape one time, agape two times, the third time, what would he have to say? Agape, agape, agape. But the third time, he doesn't say agape, he says phileo. Now look here, if agape and phileo are different words with different meanings and cannot be used equally and interchangeably, you know what you've got in verse 17? You've got a mistake. Because that would mean he said agape, agape, phileo. He said agape once, agape twice, phileo once. You see the subtlety behind the problem there? Verse 21 is the third time Jesus asked Peter, Lovest thou me? Now that's confirmed by the English text and the Greek text. But verse 17 is the first time that he used the word phileo. If Jesus is asking a different question, then it's not the third time that he asked the question. So if the word phileo and the word agape are different, as preachers say they are, then verse 17 doesn't make any sense. And there's no real explanation for why Jesus would use a word for unconditional love twice and then revert to brotherly love the third time. Why would he come down? Why would he hold the standard high and Pete can't come up to it and he comes down to Pete? That would be the reverse of what you'd expect the Lord's aspirations for Peter to be. In fact, it would be the reverse of everything going on in the chapter. Because the first question you want to ask yourself is why would three times Jesus address and talk to Simon Peter about this? Well, first I want you to notice that the word agape and the word phileo, the Greek words, are really interchangeable. Often in Scripture, they are used as equals to one another. For example, go back with me to John chapter 3, verse 35. Now, you don't need to know all this Greek stuff. I'm going to say to you again, you don't need to know Greek. You don't, need to have a, you don't have, need to have a college education. You don't need to know a preacher that has all that. If you've got a, a King James Bible, you have in your language everything you'll ever need to know to know everything God wants you to know. And what happens is that people think they'll, they'll come along and, and sort of hornswoggle you, we say down south, fool you, into thinking there's something you don't know that you need to know that you can't know unless you know what they know. And it's a typical religion trap. It starts out, number one, you can't, the Bible's written in Greek. Number two, you, if, you don't, if you can't read Greek, you can't understand the Bible. Number three, you don't read Greek. Number four, I do. So how can you understand the Bible? You've got to come to me. Now that's just another version of Protestant, Protestant popery. And it's practiced in pulpits all over the world. 
That's why when people hear me on this program talk about the King James Bible, they go, Ooh. because they understand the danger of you possessing in your hand a, a Bible that you can put absolute confidence in. Now, I've told you many times, I believe you should believe the Bible, the text that you're using, until it tells you you can't. You have a new international version, modern, uh, you know, the uh, English Standard Version, the New American, any modern version. You can, you, you should believe those books until they teach you that you can't. The problem with what we're doing is we tell you how to find out that you can't trust them. Just go look at Mark chapter 1, verse 2, in any of those modern versions, and if you can believe that that verse is right, then you don't believe in biblical infallibility. You don't believe in the absolute authority of the Scripture. You believe the Bible has mistakes in it. Now, it's okay if you want to believe that. That's your little red wagon. You're free to believe anything you want to believe. Just don't call yourself a Bible believer. So if your Bible has mistakes in it, and you don't believe the Bible ought to have mistakes in it, then you know that you've got a Bible there that has it, and you don't have the right one yet. So every tech, every, you, ought, you need to spend some time checking this stuff out. When someone comes along and tells you, well, little nuggets you need to know is the difference between agape and phileo. Look here, John 3, verse 35. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things unto Him. The Father, the word love there, what would you think it would be? Well, it says that the Father agapes, the Son. That makes sense. Now come over to chapter 5. Chapter 5, you'd say, well, that's what I'd think it would be, this divine love that the Father would have for His Son. But now look at John 5, verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son. Well, that's the same statement. But here, the underlying word is not agape. It's phileo. See how they're used interchangeably? The Father agape is the Son. The Father phileos the Son. Exactly like it says in your Bible. He loved Him. Look over at John chapter number 11. I just want you to see a couple of verses here, here real, real quick that show you that the, the two words often are used interchangeably. John chapter 11, verse number... Uh, Verse number 3, talking about Lazarus. Therefore his sister went unto him and said, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. He whom thou phileoest is sick. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. There the word is agape. She said, you phileo him, and John says, Jesus agape him. They're used interchangeably. In, in, in the Scripture. Come with me, if you will, to, uh, to Romans chapter number 12. Here's a classic verse where people use this. Get Romans chapter 12 in one hand and 1 Peter chapter number 2. Romans 12 and 1 Peter chapter, chapter number 2. Romans chapter 12, verse number 10. Be kind of affection one to another with brotherly love. There's that phileo. As I said, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And so there, there's the way that the word is generally said it ought to be translated. But if you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, you know what that is? That's agape. Now why is that that way? Because in the Bible, those two words are all are constantly being used interchangeably. Now we can go on and on and on with it. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, for example. And Titus chapter 3, Romans 5, verse 8, and Titus chapter 3. Romans 5, 8, But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners. That's the word agape. But Titus chapter 3, verse 4, 
For after the kindness and love of God our, God our Savior toward man appeared. There the love of God is the phileo. It's not agape. You say, why is it not agape? Romans 5, 8 is. Because the two words often are used interchangeably in your Bible. Now go back with me to John 5, uh, 21. What's going on back here in John 21 with Peter? And why in the world would God, would he use these words the way he does back here? Well, the, the issue with Peter back here in John 21 is not found in, in the, in, in so much in the, in the question as is found in the answer that Christ gives. John 21, verse 15. By the way, what's he doing with Peter back here? You say, he says, so when they had dined, Jesus said, and said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. Now think about that terminology. In Matthew chapter number 16, that takes you right back to Matthew 16, verse number 17. Jesus had asked the disciples, who, who, do you, who, do, who do you say that I am? Peter stood up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou Simon Barjona. There's his old name. For flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But I say also unto you that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's addressing Peter back here as the head of the little flock. And to thee I'll give the, verse number 19, he says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What so thou should bound on earth should be bound in heaven, what so thou loose on earth should be loose in heaven. And what, what Jesus does in Matthew 21, Peter has denied him three times before the cross. You remember that. Now the Lord Jesus Christ takes Peter aside, and he's going to reestablish Peter, in the ministry that he has for the little flock, if you're not little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's going to confirm in Peter the leadership that God has for him in the little flock and the establishment system. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? That was what Peter's boast was. Peter said, I'll, they, every man can, will forsake you, but not me. But what did he do? He did forsake him. He said, Peter, I thought you said you loved me more than everybody else. And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Lord, see, Pete's still boasting in his own ability. He's still looking at Pete and thinking, I can do it. And Jesus says, Feed my lambs. Now notice in verse 15, he said, Feed my lambs. In verse 16, he says, Feed my sheep. The edification process that Peter is going to be engaged in, taking the, the lambs, the babies, and bringing them to a maturity. As newborn babes desire the sins of milk of the word, that you may grow into full-grown sheep. See, what's happening here is what he said back in Jeremiah 23, that I'm going to restore pastors to you that will teach you my word. And Pete's being established here as the leader, one of the leaders, the little flock's leadership is being reestablished. He said the second time, do you love me, Pete? And Pete said, Lord, you know I love you. <laughs> and then he says the third time, do you love me? Three denials, three confirmations. But on the third time, Pete got it. Because Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time. Do you remember in Luke 22? Jesus walked across that porch, looked out there, and saw Peter, and their eyes met. And the cock crowed that third time. And the text said, Peter will not wept bitterly. Here it is the third time to confirm his love. And this time, Pete doesn't say, you know I love you. He just says, you know everything, Lord. You know everything. He doesn't say, yay. Instead of confirming and claiming his own strength and ability, he just cast himself on the Lord. Rested in God's love and provision for him. And those three denials that led Peter into the slew of despond 
He was brought back and reestablished in his ministry. And the edification pattern is established here in these three confirmations. So rather than there being this play on words to try to trick Peter into thinking the Lord would come down to his level, the Lord really is bringing Peter back up to where he intends him to be as the leader of the little flock. By the way, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you don't get anything out of this. <laughs> Pete's not the body of Christ. Pete's not our apostle. This is about him reestablishing him as head of the kingdom program. Listen, students of the scripture are better off to stop looking for some kind of secret meaning in, the, in, in other languages and start learning the doctrinal truths from God's Word rightly divided. You don't need to look for some key in a language you can't understand. What you need to do is take God's Word. You can trust God's preserved Word in the King James Bible, and you can understand it when you rightly divide it. That's the whole purpose of what I'm trying to say to you. You can trust the Bible God gave you, and you can understand it if you study it His way. I'm glad you're with us today. Till next time, Maranatha.